Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Wednesday, October 10, 2018, regular meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. We are resuming tonight's meeting. We've just come out of executive session. Could we please pl pledge allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Could we please have the roll call? Chairman Sullivan? Here. Councilor Garvin? Here. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Councilor Penelope Jordan? Here. Councilor Lennon? Here. Councilor Randall? Here. And Councilor Straw? Here. Thank you. Uh, Town Council reports and correspondence. Do we have... <laughs> Should I open those so they don't flash? Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> If we open them, they won't make so much noise. It's got such a nice sound. <laughs> we're, we're having a problem with the breeze and our vertical blinds in town hall chambers at the moment. Councils have a correspondence. Councilor Penny Jordan. I just wanted to um, let people know about um, a forum on October 30th um, at 7 p.m. here at the town hall regarding the comprehensive plan. The draft of the comprehensive plan is out online and um, it is uh, quite um, comprehensive, so to speak, and I think that um, we'd love to have a, a big turnout as we um, gain some um, public input on the draft as well as a couple of the final chapters that we have done. So um, mark your calendar for the night before Halloween and come and join us um, here at the town hall at 7 p.m. What's next? Great, thank you. Hmm? What's uh, next? Councilor Straw? What's next? Uh, so the MMA's Legislative Policy Committee uh, met again to finalize their legislative platform uh, for the upcoming legislative session and uh, they settled on nine points um, that I'll just briefly touch on um, that they're going to be pushing for. Uh, first is revenue sharing, restoring revenue sharing to local communities. Um, next was homestead exemption, the idea of increasing the homestead exemption for uh, main residents. Uh, th third was local option sales tax. Um, a number of the communities were pushing for allowing local uh, towns to have a local sales tax of up to 1%. Um, which I strongly opposed. Uh, property, given our large commercial base here in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, the next was uh, property tax relief for everyone by instituting a means-based circuit breaker program that used to exist. Uh, property tax relief for seniors in particular. Uh, increasing state age for education to decrease the property tax burden. Uh, you'll see a theme here, it's all revenue-based. Uh, adult use marijuana tax revenue allowing towns that permit sale of marijuana to um, uh, share in a larger chunk of the sales that are generated from that locally. Uh, increasing the utility and right of way um, rights of municipalities. And then the last one was uh, uh, clarifying who would cover county inmate health care costs. And that's the, the nine planks that they were looking to focus on for the next legislative session. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, I have one thing. I last night attended the second uh, Cumberland County Finance Meeting, I'm representing the town in that. Uh, there will be two more meetings, and as it stands now, the Cumberland County is proposing a 4.98% increase from last year's budget, um, predominantly due to uh, personnel costs. And I know that absent vo absentee voting has started. I thought maybe the 
town clerk could just give us an update on the voting situation? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, as you mentioned, absentee voting started yesterday. Um, the deadline to vote absentee or request a ballot is the Thursday prior to the election, which is November 1st. Um, we set up this uh, chamber here for anyone wishing to uh, vote absentee or needs to register to vote as well. Uh, we are here regular hours um, of town hall. We open at 7.30 weekdays, and we do ask um, that folks come uh, at least 15 minutes prior to when we close. We're finding even just two days into it, it's taking folks quite a while to uh, vote the ballots if they're doing them here. Um, and so closing at four o'clock, you know, we just wanna leave a few minutes for folks to be able to vote before we close. So um, 3.45 would be uh, the deadline uh, here weekdays, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And our next item on the agenda is really just a reminder that uh, the next regular meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council will be held on Wednesday, November 14. This is because of the Veterans Day holiday on the prior Monday. And uh, we'll also be having a caucus on Tuesday, November 13, the day before, at the lower level conference room. The f so next item is the Finance Committee report. Councilor Garvin. Thank you, Councilor Sullivan. Um, <clears throat> Uh, excluded, unfortunately, from the packet um, was the, the one-page dashboard. Matt just sent it to me. We'll make sure that it gets posted with the other meeting materials and distributed um, widely to the council. Um, the information will show not any significant material change in most of the things that we poured out on for revenues and expenditures. The one item um, that Matt and I discussed uh, just a moment ago, though, was that um, we do have the $1.5 million of new debt associated with the borrowing for the um, capital equipment purchased, uh, inclusive of the fire truck and ambulance and dump truck. So, or multi-purpose truck. Um, so uh, that appears, uh, we'll see that in the new, uh, reflected in the debt status section. But other than that, there's nothing um, significantly out of line or out of expectation from any of the other key areas that we report on. Um, if anybody has any questions or has reviewed the control and distribution reports, um, I'm happy to discuss those now. But if not, that's the report of the Finance Committee. Are there any questions for uh, Councilor Garvin, the Finance Chair? No? no? Great. Thank you. Uh, the next item <clears throat> is a citizen opportunity for discussion of items that are not on tonight's agenda. Would anyone like to address the council on an item that is not on tonight's agenda? Please come forward and give us your name and address. Sure, good evening, uh, Jerry Canaller, 1890 Road. I just have uh, two quick questions that I'm looking for an update on. Back during the budget process, there was discussion of adding a finance director to the town. I was wondering what's the current status of that? And then the second question was there was also a lot of discussion around getting a committee together, organized to look at alternative revenue ideas. I just saw the list of committees posted on the town website seeking volunteers and I didn't see that committee out there. So I was just looking for an update on both of those topics. Thank you. Um, I'd like, I would, I wonder if the town manager could address at least one of those, perhaps. Uh, the, the one conversation we did have this summer was uh, about going forward with the finance director within the coming, upcoming fiscal year. I have had a couple different meetings with the superintendent uh, pursuing this option as well, discussing how we may have that fit within the uh, hierarchy of the town's operations. And I'm currently also working on a, a position description as well to bring back uh, for council uh, consumption later. And regarding the other item, I don't, there hasn't been any uh, movement at this point towards that. Um, as you might be aware, we've been pretty tied up with some other issues and I suspect that the new council going forward might, might want to entertain those, those thoughts. Councilor Garvin. Uh, the one thing I would just add is we did have a meeting in July, I think, yeah. um, and are having continuing conversations just generally about um, town finances, uh, different ways to you know, approach creating and managing some of the budget challenges and things like that. So the creation of some committee was one possibility that was among many that was, I think, discussed back during the budget season. So um, those meetings that we've had and will continue to have are you know, open for public participation and public comment. Um, and I think that you know, we'll continue to explore what is the best means to 
engage an appropriate cross section of people um, that are you know certainly interested in this in this item. So, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Is there anyone else? All right. I will. We'll move on. Could we please have the town manager's monthly report? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I'd like to uh, start off this evening by talking about Cape Elizabeth Community Services. They have some exciting fall offerings and these offerings can be seen at the Cape Explorer online at capecommunityservices.org. Community Services has a renewed promotion of senior programming available in their quarterly newsletter and it's called Primetime. It is available to be viewed online. It's sent to all who are in the community services database and we will mail it to people who prefer to receive their mail the old fashioned way. The comprehensive plan is progressing towards completion as Councilor Jordan mentioned. Uh, there will be the forum on October 30th at 7 p.m. right here at the town hall. And Cape Elizabeth TV has installed some new video equipment and the upgrades were planned as a capital project. Uh, the installation was completed last week, so uh, we are pretty excited about the improvements. The new equipment uh, will allow us the ability to stream meetings online, so you can do that right through our website. And short, in, the near distant, or in the near future, we will also be able to attach agendas to the meeting being viewed, and you'll also have the ability to add chapters. So instead of having to go through the whole extent of the meeting to get to the point that you're actually interested in or, or are looking for, you'll be able to click on, the, on, on an active agenda and get right to that point in the in the meeting. So we were looking forward to that as an improvement uh, in our communications. The upgrades were replacing the older equipment and will provide an improved video re uh, experience for folks who want to watch our town meetings. And that's uh, what I have to res respectfully submit this evening, Madam Chairman. Great, thank you very much. Any questions or comments on the town manager's report? All right, moving on. <coughs> Our next item is to review the draft minutes of September 10, 2018 and September 19, 2018 special meetings. So let's just take the first one. Uh, is there a motion to approve the draft minutes of the September 10, 2018 meeting? So moved. Thank you, is there a second? Second. second. Councilor Penny Jordan, is, is there any comments, errors, edits? No, nope, seeing none, all those in favor? They are approved, and now may I entertain a motion uh, for the for a uh, to approve the draft minutes of the September 19, 2018 special meeting. So moved. Councilor Lennon, is there a second? Second. Councilor Penny Jordan, any discussion, edits, errors? Seeing none. All those in favor? Those are also approved. Great, thank you. The next item is a public hearing on the general assistance appendices. So at this moment, I will entertain anyone from the public that would like to speak about the general assistance uh, proposed funding. Would anyone like to speak to this on this public hearing? Seeing no one coming forward, the public hearing is closed. Item number 133, general assistance appendices. We uh, set a public hearing for this on September 10. Um, the um, assistance ordinance appendix is has been recommended by the Maine Municipal Association for uh, fiscal, well, October 1 to uh, September 30, 2019. And um, I'd like to ask the town manager if he'd like to um, speak to this item before we talk, discuss and vote. Uh, I'd be happy to, thank you. Uh, this is an annual occurrence uh, that comes forward in front of the council, as you know, uh, with an annual update of these separate appendices. These uh, segments of the general assistance uh, law will give you the new qualifying standards as well as the minimums and maximums that are allowed for assistance that are provided across the state. It breaks it down by county and annually the towns will receive this information and then it's adopted for them to ex employ as we, uh, process general assistance claims throughout the course of the year. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Are there any questions for the town manager? Uh, is there a motion to approve the general assistance ordinance appendix A through D as recommended by the Maine Municipal Association effective October 1, 2018 to September 30, 2019 as presented? So moved. Councilor Penny Jordan, is there a second? Councilor Lennon? Any further discussion? Councillor Randall. I just had a question about Appendix C. So it says um, that it should not 
necessarily be adopted. And there was another option um, to adopt no housing maximums. And you know, I'm new to the council. I, I'm not familiar with how this has gone in the past. If it's always just been that we take these numbers, um, is there any reason not to set maximums in our case? If, if I may, uh, generally, I think these numbers are what they've, you know, what they've established by um, through their analysis of what uh, you you set for maximums within a county based on the ec economics, if you will. You'll notice that some counties may be higher or lower depending upon their location. So I think that's that's part of it. Uh, to be frank, I, I, I think for the 25 years that I've been involved uh, looking at these towns have traditionally just accepted it, what, what they've had. In order to have local information to do it, it would take a significant amount of effort to try to establish maximums to, to find out if you're, you're, you're tracking there, if, if that's helpful. Yeah, I think it just seemed, if I was reading it correctly, that what we could do rather than set housing maximums is just go with the overall housing, overall maximum and be flexible on the housing. And I didn't know if that made more sense I know we've been talking a lot about financial hardships that, that people might be facing, especially the elderly, and if it just made sense to, to set no housing maximum and go with that option to not adopt Appendix C. I think that's the way we would do it procedurally. Is there any dis other discussion on that? Can I ask a clarifying question? So what you're saying is to, rather than look at household uh, breakdown, to set an, a maximum no matter what household? Can you clarify what you were? So the way that I'm reading it is that we can adopt, rather than adopt the set housing maximums laid out in Appendix C, we can just go with an overall maximum and, and people are able to access the different sources. So there was the, would it still be based on uh, size of household? Right, they would still be subject to the overall maximums, which are in appendix um, A, I think. A, yeah. I'm mixing up my appendices, appendices here. But, but I think there was an option to just go with an overall maximum so that we could be a little more flexible on how much, what percentage of that um, was taken up by housing and not oh, limited. Oh, I see what because, you're saying. So a gross level max. Right. Okay. Okay. I don't know if that makes a difference. And then distribute accordingly, based on need. No, right. It's, it's based on what your what your local market is. What if if, if I may, Madam Chair? Oh, local yes, market. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What 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 they'll say is. Uh, yep. You need to do a market survey in in order to determine what your what your what your local market numbers are. And so that's, you know, this may be low compared to what we, we may have, so the maximum may be below what your actual market rents may be. Yeah, I mean, my, my concern is that um, it may be that rent in Cape Elizabeth is a little bit higher than rent in other areas of Cumberland County um, because there are so few units. And so that we may need, we may want to accommodate that difference by going with an overall maximum instead of limiting the housing, if it's possible. Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Uh, Roth, I'm sorry. Question for the uh, town manager. Yep. So the, the general assistance pool is set, and this won't affect the size of the pool. It's just if we have more applications than the overall size of the pool, it would affect how it's allocated between the Recipients, is that correct? No, it's uh, I mean, it's based it's based on on need. So if someone comes in and they do apply for GA, then then we have we do have a budgeted amount. But uh, this would be the maximum that we can provide. Uh, but it, it doesn't get ratcheted down based on if we have you know by the end of the year if we have only so many dollars left, we can only provide them a percentage of it. It'd be more. We we would overspend that line if we had to provide that. Uh, uh, so. Um, there, we don't. Res there isn't a limit that once we hit the hard limit, that's it. Instead, it's we just budget a particular amount, but they're entitled to whoever's entitled to it can take the full amount they're entitled. They can to. take up to that up to Got that it. amount. So, right. if, if say that the rent amount for say a two bedroom apartment in Cape was uh, let me just get to that. 
or in, let's say in Cumberland County to bedroom apartment, this would allow you to, if it was heated, it would be $1,006. If it was unheated, it would be up to $868. Uh, it's, it's not a, a gigantic amount because there is not, not a high level of participation on the, on the rental assistance side in town. It, do, it does take place. Uh, mostly it's due to the dearth of rental units that are available within the community. Uh, so it's not, we're, we're not as prone to be receiving requests for assistance on the rental side of it as say other communities are that have more rental housing such as Portland, Westbrook, South Portland may, may have, uh, which those other communities uh, from what I understand will generally accept or, or adopt the, uh, the standards that they have. And so, so Council Lennon, yep. from it. So, to address Valley's concern, are you essentially saying that what's set forth in our packet adequately addresses her concern because it's not a hard and fast ceiling? So what she's concerned about is already taken into account in what we have before us? Is that essentially what you're saying? Could you, could you ask me that again? I'm saying Valerie's con Valerie's a concern. In your opinion, is what the, the, the statutes and this packet that we have, does it adequately address Valerie's concern? I think it has. Okay. Uh, it so in other words, I, I totally get her concern. I think it's well well thought and well asked, but if it's if you're not concerned that there's gonna be a problem with it based on the reality in Cape Elizabeth, that there's not many rental places, et cetera, et cetera, and if it did go over, we would pay it anyway, are you saying that her, she shouldn't be concerned? Is that effectively what I'm saying? I think it's a I think it's a legitimate concern because I think the rents are significantly high. Uh, at the same time, I think that we do not there's not a great level of demand when it comes to rental assistance with, within the within the town. So it's kind of a double-edged sword when it comes to it. So if you do set no maximum uh, eligibility, it says should be analyzed in terms of the overall maximum. So you could look at that, and that could be your guide as to where you may use. Uh, Can I, I don't have as, as an answer for that. Yeah. I was just thinking, so say, this is what I was looking at. So say for example, you have a three person family, the overall maximum that they're eligible for is around $1,400 a month, which can be divided between housing and food um, and their and electric food. and so on. Um, but say for example that household isn't accessing the, the food benefits or the electrical because they had other resources. If we don't adopt Appendix C, they could, if they had a two bedroom apartment, um, they would be limited to around $1,000. But if we didn't adopt Appendix C, the way that I read it is that we could give them the full 1400 to their rent if that's what their rent actually was. Okay. Which, although we maybe don't have that many people who are accessing it, it could be a huge difference for people who do access that if that, if my reading is correct. So let me ask again, because I'm, uh, so if we were to adopt, if, so you're saying if we don't adopt a C, <coughs> that we might be able to give certain individuals their full rent. My, my question is, it, again, the, the, the amount of money that we would end up spending, should there be a, a long line of recipients, how would we handle that in our budget? If, if we were to... If we were to ex exceed the amount that we have budgeted, then yeah. we would... It would come out of our... We would probably have to match it with the general fund. Have we ever exceeded it, to your knowledge? I, I, not to my knowledge in the council. I think the key thing to remember is even if we eliminate the uh, limit on housing, the overall limit remains of, let's use for the three person household of 1483. So yeah. even if we've said, oh, you're not limited, I don't know what the number was, 1200 for housing, or you can go up to the 1483 for um, just for housing, it basically simplifies, I imagine, the paperwork because all they have to do is apply with the rent. But um, I, I'm not concerned about eliminating Appendix C because of the fact that it still has that, that limit. So they can't come in and say, oh, I want $20,000 a month in rent. It's still that, that hard limit of with the three, 1483. But um, 
right? Again, I have no idea how this actually works, but that's what well, it looks like. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not quite, maybe I'm missing something, but I, I don't know why uh, accepting Appendix C uh, hamstrings us, I guess, is what I'm not quite clear on, Councilor Randall. So Appendix C just limits, so it's divided up so that there's an overall maximum and we're, I'm not, if we eliminate Appendix C, we're still subject to the overall maximum. So someone accessing the full range of general assistance could potentially get up to that overall maximum. However, by adopting Appendix C, we limit the amount of that that they could use for rent. And it's possible that someone might be in a situation where they don't necessarily need the food benefits because they have another solution. Um, whatever that may be through food pantry, through whatever, whatever resource they have, um, or they don't need to access the electrical benefits. Um, mm -hmm. we, this would allow them to use those funds, but to use it towards rent. So they'd still be limited, so it wouldn't, it wouldn't go over mm -hmm. what we have budgeted um, based on people, if we're, if we're accounting for people using what they're permitted to, it would just allow flexibility in giving them more to put towards rent. Okay. Anyone else? Is there any um, uh, is there any problem regulatory that you're aware of if we were to do that? Because, to my knowledge, we've never done that before. Do you, could you foresee any problem with the county, or uh, if if we were to do that? I mean, I, I wouldn't think so. But I, I don't. That's I don't, my only other question. <clears throat> I think the governor would be the maximum that you do have that is there. Um, mm -hmm. the, the okay. most participation I think we have is on the other appendices, quite honestly, on food and, and utility and, and heating assistance is where we find uh, the most traffic. Um, the rental side, not not as much. Uh, it, it may be worthwhile to take a look at it for a year and see what impact that may have okay. uh, if you decide not to accept and then, and then not have the maximum, but then at the same time know that they can't overcome that. Uh, if there's anything different from that, I'd be happy to report back to the council next month. Uh, with, you know, uh, we can talk with our GA administrator to see where they're at and what his thoughts may be on it as well, and then going forward. And maybe, uh, Debbie, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, it, maybe it's wise if the council has a discussion on all but Appendix C, Appendix C and we can take action or you can take action on all the other elements, and then I can come back in November and you can discuss that and I can have more information if that'd be more helpful and then you can adopt it at that time if that would, if that would please the council. Yeah, Council Strong. Uh, do we have to adopt something? Uh, is there some requirement that, so um, I'd be okay just adopting it as is with C, but next year let's figure this out and, and not use it going forward if it doesn't make sense. I, so I, okay. I, could, I could do that as well yeah. if that pleases the council, but, I, but I, I may be able to come back with more information on that and as to what that is. Oh, we, uh, we outsource the GA as a, as, as a rule right now. Well, Councilor Randall, are you okay with that? I mean, it's, it's, a, very, um, it's a very thoughtful consideration, um, but I think the manager has a point about checking with our general assistance compliance officer. Um, would you be, are you content with letting us go ahead and vote as we have it presented before us, but with the town manager researching the possibility of next year uh, eliminating Appendix C? Yeah, I think that sounds good. And in the in Appendix C, it says that um, that you know we can we can conduct a market survey or adopt no housing maximums, but we should look at what the local rent values are. So maybe for next year, we could when we revisit this issue, have a look at local. <coughs> housing values. Okay, Council Garvin. If there isn't a specific imperative to take action tonight, I like Matt's suggestion about voting on all the other appendices and then effectively tabling C to bring back to the next meeting. I um, agree. I think, that's, I think that makes good sense, okay. and, unless there's some other reason why it has to be voted out tonight. But okay, Matt. If I may, add, yeah. the, the maximum still sits as the, as the overriding principle, so I, I think you'd be okay with that. Take action on all but C if you wanted to right. and, and table that for reconsideration next month. Then I can reach out to MMA and the other powers that be to try to get full clarification on that. Okay. Okay. I think that's it. Uh, I agree because I think otherwise we're going to get to next year and we won't have done what we had set out to do. And I think, I think um, Valerie has a, a really good suggestion 
and this is just how GA's been set up for years, and we're just kind of challenging how it might get distributed. I like it. Yep. Council Lennon? I was just gonna make a motion, and should I join a motion? <coughs> I would love a motion. <laughs> okay. The Cape of the Town Council approves the General Assistant Ordinances Appendix A, B, and D, excluding C, as recommended by the Maine Municipal Association effective October 1st, 2018 to September 30th, 2019, as presented. Your second? Councilor Randall? Second. <laughs> Any more discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thanks. Thank you. I'll be back. Okay. <laughs> that sounds great. Thank you. All right, item number 134, proposed commercial van, bus, and vehicle traffic and fees. Uh, of course, this is a, at Fort Williams Park. Um, we have an opportunity for the public to comment on this item. If anyone would like to speak to the council, you have three minutes. To, if you would like to, please come forward. Mm -hmm. Your name and address, please. Sure, hello again, <laughs> Jerry Canella, 18 Ivy Road. So I had a chance to review the proposal and I have just sort of a rhetorical question for the town council. Do you believe that the proposal as it stands gives the town its fair share of revenues for visitors, out-of-state visitors specifically, that enter the park via commercial vehicles? So just as a reminder, we bear all the risk. So I'm sure you're all familiar with it, the liability risk, visitor safety, environmental and pollution risk, cleaning and maintenance, traffic flow safety, et cetera. There's a number of risks that we bear. In the proposal, if I'm understanding it properly, for 2019, the estimate for revenues or fees generated for all the commercial vehicle uh, is 87,400, is that correct? Yeah, so for the sake of simple math, which I like, let's just round that up to $100,000 to keep things simple. So how many park visitors from an out-of-state visitors come to the park from commercial vehicles? That number is a little difficult to find and uncover, but I have a very conservative low estimate that it's roughly 150,000 out-of-state visitors on an annual basis that come to the park. I think that's low and very conservative. So if I do the quick math, 100,000 in revenue, divided by 150,000 uh, visitors that come via commercial uh, way, that's 67 cents per visitor. So I ask again, do you believe that the proposal gets our fair share of revenue from the visitors that are out of state and that for the risk that we bear in the town? No longer a rhetorical question, the answer is no. I think that's <laughs> very, very low and very generous and that means all the revenues are really going to the cruise lines and the, the bus companies. It's likely that these visitors would come to the park, whether it's no charge, a dollar, or much more. So what I'm looking for is something that will collect a revenue on a five to $10 per person or per visitor uh, basis. I think that's reasonable, and let's try to get our fair share. Now, how you equate that to the contracts and agreements that you have with the tourist companies that would have to be worked out. I don't understand, I really don't understand. I get the history, but I don't understand the aversion right now in our community to collect our fair share of revenues from out of state visitors, especially when you're trying to do all the things in the park, comprehensive plan, school system, the town services. Just makes no sense to me. So I'm asking that the town sort of reject the proposal this evening and task the Fort Williams Park Committee to kind of look at this and look at what the maximum opportunity and how to optimize the revenues for the commercial um, vehicles and the visitors that come in from that standpoint. Thanks. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to the council on this item? Mm, seeing no one, we'll just move along. Item 134, again, proposed commercial van, bus and vehicle traffic fees. Uh, Fort Williams Commercial Passenger Vehicle Subcommittee uh, was established by Fort Williams Park Committee at, at the council's request to review commercial passenger vehicles at Fort Williams Park. Uh, they uh, presented their report to us on May 14. We reviewed this uh, in detail in a workshop session on July 16 of this year. So we are here to consider adoption of this proposal and, and next steps. Um, I've got my original copy in front of me, but there quite a, there's quite a list of um, 
uh, items that they are recommending. Um, eliminate commercial van and bus traffic from Captain Strauss Circle, improve bus parking logistics and central parking, enhance the walkways, that's number three. Number four, deploy benches and railings as needed between central parking and Portland Headlight. Implement a commercial vehicle capacity based fee structure. There's, I, I won't continue reading all that. Um, there is a fee schedule that they're recommending, um, which I'm sure we'll, we'll be talking about. And I, I think that we could probably, I'm, I'm personally hoping we increase some of the fees that are on that original, our original recommendation. Um, would the town manager like to speak to this? Uh, I'd love to. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, yes, when it, when it does come to fees, it's important for the council to understand that council sets fees. Uh, therefore, uh, you know, in consideration of Mr. Canellar's uh, 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 testimony, this is just a recommendation that's been brought forward by the committee, not uh, not a hard and fast number. It's just it's a starting point, I guess, in, in many different ways. So the council has the full right to decide to set these at the level that you that you feel is appropriate. The other uh, recommendations that do that have come forward, uh, we have been working with staff to try to plan ahead for some of those, specifically to the pedestrian improvements. Uh, next week, I know uh, myself, Bob Malley, and Kathy Raftis will be meeting with uh, John Mitchell to look at some of the improvements that need to take place to, if we are not going to allow bus traffic to enter into the circle to uh, and, and to be parking in the central parking lot to be uh, able to traverse to get down to the Portland headlight uh, in easier fashions with certain things as no handicap tip downs, uh, resting spots, and things along resting points along the way that can make that transition uh, better. Uh, I will say, uh, if you've been to the park at all within the past couple weeks, you would be slightly overwhelmed. Uh, would be the under understatement of the decade. Uh, we have had to have because it's been. Let's just say this is the peak of cruise ship season. On. This past weekend, there were, I think there were no less than five boats that came in over the period of four days, one of which had roughly 5,000 people on it, uh, bringing approximately 40 to 50 buses in on a, on a day, um, each carrying roughly 50 people at a time. Uh, so that's a significant amount, plus all the other automobile traffic that's come in. So we've had to deploy additional rangers uh, to help Know, manage the traffic as people are coming in. Uh, we have, uh, there's a lot of challenges. Uh, we met, I did meet last week with Carrie Curtis, who's our new park coordinator, uh, Kathy Reftis, Gene Gross, Bob Malley, uh, and myself got together to talk about, you know, where are we now? What are the challenges? Because with having Carrie in the park, we're getting to see a lot more and have a better feel for things, although, you know, by having more boots on the ground, which fortunately we've needed uh, and, and have had them there. So, uh, I guess this is a long story way of saying, you know, we need we need to do something, and there is, I think, economically, there's room to grow when it comes to the fees that that they are charging. And if you look in comparison, I know uh, Fort Williams Park Committee Chairman Jim Walsh was talking to me about the, you know, he he's a he's a wealth of information when it comes to what the, what fees are being charged in other parks uh, across the state of Maine for, you know, in Acadia, for instance, and what changes they've made when it comes to tourism buses coming in there. So uh, it's, it's we're, we're slightly, we're being overwhelmed uh, when it comes to that. So I think in order to be able to have the funding to maybe apply to accepting some of this capacity, this, this is a good model to do it, as well as a way to manage the traffic that does flow through, flow through the park at the present time. Thank you, Council Lennon. I totally agree with this gentleman. I, I, no one will be surprised. I want all the fees to go up. I think the parking fees should go up more. You guys talked me out of that at the workshop, but you know, I love the work the committee did. I agree with everything in this report, but these fees and mm -hmm. I, I really, really think that the town, even the people who are opposed to parking fees say, but charge the buses. Like there's no disagreement in town about that. And as we talked about in the workshop, um, I love that the committee's primary goal was to um, be welcoming and encouraging and open to anyone who wants to be there. I, I'm not actually convinced that that's the citizens' um, final goal. I think people are really looking for 
some revenue to be generated there, at, at least enough to cover our, our significant and growing costs in trying to keep uh, one step ahead of the significant wear and tear of having so many people. And, and I think, secondly, and probably more importantly, I really think people are looking for us to manage the overwhelming tourist visitors that come there. It's overwhelming. No one in Cape wants to use the park anymore from May till November, and I think that's sad. So I am in favor of significantly increasing all of these fees, which I honestly don't think is gonna hurt the buses or the, they're just gonna increase the price to, for the people who are on the cruise ships, and people on cruise ships, they're not gonna notice an extra five bucks. They're already paying for every excursion they go. They're, they're breaking out their checkbook. Honestly, no one down the chain is going to be, um, you know, inversely impacted in any way that will cause any pain to anyone, in my opinion. So that's how I feel. I mean, I'm happy to adopt this. I'm happy to sit here and up these fees. I'm happy to send it back to the committee and say we love everything, but you need to triple these. I don't know how to go about it, but I, I feel very strongly about this. I've, I've got some thoughts on that, but Councilor Garvin. I was gonna make a motion, actually. So yeah. if you would rather. Please, please I move that we accept and uh, uh, direct for the implementation of recommendations one through four and that we refer recommendations five through seven to our next workshop for the purpose of actually calculating what those increases would be. I don't think we should be doing that here on the fly tonight, so that's my motion. I second that. <coughs> All right, any, any more discussion? I, I, I'm sorry, we, we're, our discussion period is closed. I uh, wish you had come forward when we had that opportunity. Um, I did speak with, uh, Jim Walsh today, who's the chairman of the Fort Williams Park Committee, and he, because of what he has learned, he recommends, and I just want to put this in for the record, he recommends that the motor coach uh, 2019 uh, fee, as you see right now, is $75. He recommends that be immediately changed to $150. Well um, you know, he would he recommends that for this fee schedule. Um, so I, you know, I mean, I, I. Th I think that if we, I don't, when is our next workshop scheduled? I, I don't think we, I don't think we have one, do we? Just a moment. I mean, we've, we've been dealing with this for a while, uh, so I don't know why we couldn't. You know, one of, the, one of the issues is this is a year out, so, you know, we do need to um, get things going. And so I, I certainly wouldn't, would not want to delay this vote really significantly if we can avoid that. We've been doing we we set a workshop. Yeah, we could set a workshop, that's right. Yep. Should Council we do Lennon? It the same night as the caucus, which usually goes pretty quickly. We could do it before the caucus mm -hmm. or after. Yep. Is, was, is that what the council would like to do, November 13? Uh, my only concern about the caucus would be typically outgoing members of the council aren't, aren't participants in the caucus. No, but we'd arrive after, or before well, and leave or whatever. Actually, I'd, I'd flip that. The, the incoming councilors participate in the caucus, but they will not have taken their seats, so right. they will not be right. voting. No, that, but if, if, if the outgoing members who typically don't participate or attend the caucus, then <coughs> you're looking at potentially four councilors there. Well, we could certainly invite everyone to be there, and we could do this part of the workshop first, and, you know, and then have the caucus for the incoming council after that. How about that? That way, outgoing people are fully invited and fully participating. Right, and then they get up to speed and everyone has to be there anyway, so it's not an additional date. Yeah. It's just a thought. Yeah. The only one other item that I had was uh, speaking with staff on this. Uh, you know, this is proactive. This is for next year, is what you're looking at now. And we do have a, a, a communication strategy in place to share that information when the fees are set to let the folk, let, you know, the interested parties know what the new fees would be set at, so well in advance of the season. So we wanted to make sure if there is any changes or if there are any changes that folks are well advised as to what those would be. I mean, we, you know, we've, we've had one workshop on this already. We're here tonight. I, what I'd like to do is see if we could have this as an agenda item for November 14, and we can review this the prior evening if, you know, people are, because we do have a time time schedule. Councilor Straw? Uh, the one thing I would, uh, I'm fine with that. Yep. The one thing I'd like to have uh, prepared for the workshop is it just a back of the envelope calculation of the cost to completely resurface Shore Road from South Portland to the fort. Just 
those buses are destroying that road and we should, in setting these fees, we should know how much it's costing us with respect to road wear and tear. Okay. Any other thoughts at the moment? I, I won't ask Councilor Straw to include Mitchell Oker <laughs> and, and Glendon as I watch three buses pull around that corner of my Good point. Good this point. weekend, but it's, it's, well, if, if we could fix Google Maps, that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, I think, uh, uh, so the motion on the table is to... Yes, to so the, I, I, the, the point I wanted to hammer home is I, I just, I, I appreciate the need for expedience on this mm -hmm. and, and I fully support that. I don't want to be us to be doing the math tonight. Right. I, I don't right. think that's very productive. Right. So right. Um, I think... Exactly. It would be very nice to have Jim Walsh there, actually. He has a huge history with it. Okay. So the motion on the table is to, is to approve recommendations one through four. Would, would the council like to discuss any of those recommendations? I, no. I would like to say again uh, how much I appreciate the work of Fort Williams Park Committee and the subcommittee. I think that they are doing an outstanding job to tackle what has been an overwhelming increase in the use of the park and we are the stewards of the park. And um, I think these are outstanding recommendations. So with that said, um, we have a motion on the table. Are all those in favor of approving recommendations one through four? Opposed, no, there's no opposition. It, and it is unanimous. So uh, recommendations one through four are, have been approved. And we will um, put the rest of this to a, a workshop on November 13th. Item number 135, Harbor Committee Report. Uh, we have an opportunity for the public to comment. Uh, would anyone like to speak to this item, the Harbor's Committee Report? Seeing no one, we'll move along. Uh, we um, received this report uh, on, uh, May, I'm sorry, on May 14. We reviewed the report in two workshop sessions, September 17 and also on October 2nd. And so what we're recommending on this agenda <coughs> is to refer the report to the ordinance committee. So I will entertain a motion to send this to ordinance. Council Lennon. Uh, I move that we refer to the ordinance committee the proposed amendments to chapter 10 coastal waters and harbor ordinance for review and recommendation as recommended by the harbors committee. Thank you. Is there a second? second. Council Straw. Okay. Any, any discussion? Any more thoughts on this? I know you reviewed this the other, well, October 2nd, I was ill, and thank you, Council Garvin, for chairing the meeting in my absence. Um, again, I'd like to thank the Harbors Committee for all their work. Um, they've looked at a great many issues, and, and uh, it's a pretty con comprehensive report, so I'm certainly very happy to send this on to ordinance for the next step. So, any more comments? All those in favor? It's unanimous, thank you. Item number 136, pay and display parking regulations in Fort Williams Park. Would anyone from the public like to speak to this item? Pay and display, please come forward. <laughs> Your name and address again, please. Jerry Keller, 18 Ivy Road. Sorry, three for three tonight. Um, so there appears to be an ongoing concern in our community and Councilman Lennon mentioned it a minute ago about charging a visitor at Fort Williams Park, not on the commercial side, but other visitors. So I'm really referring to out-of-state visitors and not main residents. I think that's where the focus should be on, on this. Um, I've heard residents at previous town council meetings and have seen letters in local newspapers voice, voicing this concern, so in the Cape Courier and the Southern Forecaster and those types of things. At a recent town council workshop, I heard one resident use the following analogy. That Central Park in, re in Manhattan remains free for everyone in the world to use. So why shouldn't we keep our park free for everyone to use? So that's an interesting uh, analogy. But there's a problem with it. As you know, the Central Park isn't free. Uh, it has a $65 million annual operating budget. So who pays for that? And how does that work? So there's really two things for, the, for Central Park and their budget. 80% of their annual operating budget is funded through aggressive fundraising, donations, and, and gifts from wealthy individuals. It's not uncommon to see seven and eight digit gifts made to the park on an annual uh, basis for their, for their operating budget. 
Uh, recently, somebody donated a $100 million gift to the park. So there's a fair amount of fundraising and, a, and aggressive fundraising used at the park to, to fund 80% of their budget. The remaining budget comes from the diverse tax base that they have. So Central Park has over 40 million visitors annually to the park, 25 million from out of state. When those out of state visitors come to the park, they stay in Manhattan, they dine in Manhattan, they shop in Manhattan, and they entertain in Manhattan. When out of state visitors come to our park, unless they're staying at in by the sea, going to Two Lights for a lobster roll, they're staying, dining, and shopping at a surrounding community or nearby community, not in Cape Elizabeth. So we lose, we bear all the risk, and we lose all the tax revenue generated that goes to another community outside of Cape Elizabeth. So Central Park is really self-sustaining through fundraising in a very diverse tax base. Now, unless that model can be applied here, I, I, I don't think it can really easily, then I think we need, this is why we sort of need to look at how to offset some of the costs and do some of the things that we want to do in the town by generating um, a fee. Now, I'm not necessarily for a pay and display fee model, but I'm willing to work with it. And again, I think a reasonable cost would be 10 to $15 per car for an out-of-state resident, not a main resident, for an out-of-state resident. I think the math was there's two to 2.3 people on average in a car that comes into the, the park. I think I've seen that map from Jim Walsh. Mr. Connell, your three minutes are up. If you could wrap up your statement. Sure. So that's, again, $5 a person you know, in the car. It seems like that's very reasonable and something that we should consider. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Peter Rich, uh, 19 Cottage Farms Road. And I've been talking to some of my neighbors, and, and most of them are in the in the uh, in the thought that we shouldn't charge to go to cable to, to, to the park. Um, but I don't think they realize really what's happening there. Did it's you say the, that they shouldn't it's, charge? It's, it's I, not, I, it's not, I didn't understand you. I'm sorry. Most of the folks that I've talked to in my neighborhood, in in Cottage Farms area, don't want to have the park charged to, for folks to go there. Not commercial traffic, that's separate, but for the, for the average run of the mill person going in there, they don't want to have a charge. Um, but I don't think they understand the ramifications of the amount of traffic that they get at the park. It's not like it was 10 years ago. Uh, nowadays, it's so congested that if you want to have a little league game up there or, or t-ball or whatever, you're competing with everybody else to go to use the facility. So I understand the, the limits of the park. Um, but one thing needs to be addressed. If you're going to do parking, a parking fee for in-state residents, then you're going to have to address parking outside of the area because a lot of people are going to uh, go to the park, go to the baseball field across the way, or park in the neighborhood that's not considered that's not part of the park, it, you'll have to have stickers like they have on the West End in Portland so that resident parking is not, not obliterated during the day by people going to the, going to the park. I, don't, I haven't heard anybody address that. I think that's a legitimate concern for the neighbors. Uh, we have Airbnb areas in town now that are already having that sort of problem and neighbors are complaining about, and I think this would add to that. So in your, in your, in your um, consideration, please take the na surrounding neighborhood into consideration because that is a concern. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, we'll close the public comment on this and, um, and begin our discussions. Uh, at the, we uh, had asked the Fort Williams Park Committee to develop a subcommittee to bring us information on pay display. We did not ask them for an opinion on whether or not we should go there, but rather we asked them for data and research on the possibilities and the types of uh, meters that are being used and so forth. Um, <clears throat> We uh, received their report on August 13, and we reviewed it at two workshops, September 17 and just recently on October 2. Um, 
And we, so anyway, we're continuing to review the feasibility of a, a pay display parking system. Uh, if we decide to do that, then we will need to refer this to the ordinance committee because we will need to have a parking regulation. So I'd like to ask the town manager to speak to this item now. Thank you, Madam Chairman, I'd be happy to. <clears throat> the reason why we have this on the agenda this evening is uh, in order to actually ever have f you know, paid and display parking, you need to have the legal uh, structure that allows you to, to establish that. So that's why we brought this forward to the, or the recommendation is to bring it to the ordinance uh, committee so they could craft the ordinance or amend the ordinance to to have the kind of language that you will will need to enforce in the future when there is a violation. So uh, this is basically the legal framework under which if the town does decide to go for pay, to pay and display uh, approach at the fort, this would provide the, the language under which you would be able to accomplish that under. Okay. It, it's not saying, by sending this to the Ordinance Co Review Committee or the Ordinance Committee, it, it, it's not saying that you're going forward with it. It's, it's basically, it's, there's, there's two parallel tracks that need to be traveled on. One is the discussion on the, the actual concept of pay and display, and the other one is if you decide to do that, you need to have the legal framework there. So if you can have them both traveling at the same time and arriving at the same station, that would be a good, a good thing. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, a little confusing. <laughs> But um, you know, we we certainly, as I understand, uh, Matt has just told us, we certainly can vote to proceed with the paid display concept, uh, and uh, and well, more than the concept, but the actuality of getting um, estimates and and uh, working with the manager to uh, talk to vendors. Um, as well as send it to ordinance at the same time for that crafting that parking regulation. Yep. So, yep. Councilor, well, actually, Councilor Lennon was first. I, think. I was just going to make a motion. Okay. Um, and I have a quick question. I mean, in other words, we could send this to the ordinance committee so they could be at work on it. They seem like they have a lot on their agenda. And also be continuing to have this conversation and explore. And you're talking about so it's it's not we're not we're not sealing the deal or just nudging it forward effectively well it's if, 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 yeah if, please if, yeah. What, what this is is uh, there, there are two structures that need to be in place one would be that you know to say we want to have pay and display parking the other one th this one that you're referring to ordinance committee is to say if you do have it this is the legal framework and, or the language that you need to comply with. So if it, it would state, you know, all the different rules that one would have to comply with to, to say, you know, to be legally parked, or if they get out of those, you know, the two hour limit or something along that line, that there's a violation. So you, you just need to have that language. It's kind of like, right. you know, if you walk across the street unsafely, uh, it's jaywalking, but it's not jaywalking if there's not a law against it. Okay, so I'll just so. make a, a motion well, so we can talk. Yep, so what, I, what, what I'm hearing is that probably what we should do is initially vote on whether or not to proceed to pursue pay, dis, pay display parking. And then if we decide to do that, then we then <coughs> send it to ordinance. Am I correct no, no, or am I messing no, I think, up? No, it's as simple as just sending it to ordinance. Okay. Like, yeah, <laughs> just, okay. that's as clean as that. Yeah. Um, just sending it to ordinance, okay. Yeah, the other part would be uh, because we would a, do that a separate issue. Yeah. Okay, very good. Council Lennon? So I'm just going to make the motion. Um, I move we refer to the Ordinance Committee, Chapter 13, Traffic Regulations to Address Pay and Display Parking Regulations to Fort, Fort Williams Park. All right, is there a second? Second that. Councilor Penny Jordan. All right, and discussion. Councilor Garvin. I just want to be clear, the Ordinance Committee is talking about the traffic regulations and enforcement and things like that. that there's nothing coming out of ordinance that is in any way pertain, pertains to the fee schedule or anything like that, so. Okay. Yep, that, that, that would be correct, Councilor Garvin. Councilor Randall? Um, it seems a little premature to send it to ordinance and have ordinance do the work on this if we haven't yet committed to pay and display. So I'm wondering if we should set for some time in the near future that item, whether we're going to implement pay and display, and then talk about sending this to ordinance. 
Councillor Straw? Uh, I agree with Councillor uh, Randall with the caveat that by having the ordinance committee, uh, yes, it would be a shame if they have to sit down and do all this work and then it just gets tossed out. Um, the one benefit would be having them sit down and think all this through as it will perhaps help inform us with that final decision. Um, the town manager has a thought. If, 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 thought. if, if it may be helpful, uh, the ordinance work is, uh, takes, takes time. And then if you, you know, looking at the calendar, if you will do, you know, if the council decides or the town decides that it wants to go forward and implementing pay and display parking at the fort, you know, we have a calendar. If you're looking at for next year, potentially if you say a May 1st to November 1st window, it's gonna take a while for the ordinance committee to craft the language that needs to be done for that, as well as for it to come back to the council, the council to review that, possibly making recommendations for changes that they don't like or they may want to see more of within the ordinance and then also bringing it back to the council, having the public hearing process, adoption process, and then implementation process where it would become law 30 days if after the council passes it. So I'm just looking at the calendar, trying to uh, move that forward. In no way am I saying that, uh, you know, one way, shape, or they are two separate discussions, I understand that, but I understand one is more of a, can be, a, I guess, the, the council decision on going forward with pay and display is, is a much quicker decision from the structure process than the ordinance work that, that needs to take place in order to accomplish the council's goal, if that's, if that's what you so choose to do, if, if that helps. Councilor Randall, follow-up question. Um, so if ultimately the council votes against pay and display, does ordinance just then bring it back to the council and say, do we have permission to stop? If, if mm -hmm. I may, yeah, ex exactly. If council decides that they don't want to go down that avenue, then uh, ordinance committee would have a have a, uh, a a new vacancy on their schedule for their work going forward. Right. <laughs> Council Lennon, I, I'd just like to throw out there that maybe you know in a month two council two of us won't be here, and it seems fair to let the new council vote on it. I mean they're out there talking to citizens probably more than I am at this point. So I, I mean maybe we could take a straw vote, although I would. I garnered from our workshop that we're generally pretty in favor of at least moving. But, but I mean, I, I think it's, I guess I'm in favor of moving this to ordinance, keeping these tracks moving, but letting the ultimate decision be in the, with the new council in December. Well, I, I would have just the opposite view. Okay. <laughs> because some of us have been, you know, dealing with this for quite a while. But they can and always undo the vote, I mean. Right. Well, perhaps, but you know, and, and I'd like to say a couple of things because I, you know, unfortunately was ill and missed our October 2nd workshop. Uh, you know, I read through the notes of the workshop and I wanted to address, uh, address some questions that apparently came up and, uh, uh, and just say a few things, which is what I would have offered had I been able to be there. Apparently there was, you know, questions about what, what, what are the objectives of pay and display and why would we do this and, you know, what are we hoping to gain and so forth and so on. So just, just for what it's worth and if you'll indulge me having missed the, the second. To my mind, the objectives of, of the revenue that we would generate from pay to display would be, first of all, to help us with the safety and maintenance of Fort Williams Park. Um, as you know, we average about $250,000 a year above any revenues we receive to, to take care of that. Uh, Councilor, um, um, Fort Williams Park Committee Chairman uh, uh, Jim Walsh told me that we are about $6 million, uh, uh, we have about $6 million of deferred maintenance that needs to take place on the fort. So we're, we're really just keeping band-aids on things at this point. So I would say the objectives would be the safety and the maintenance of Fort Williams Park, also uh, to help with other projects, you know, that, that come up from time to time. Um, we have a mission and a vision statement for the park and these revenues would help us, you know, follow our mission uh, of safety and maintenance and to help everyone have the best experience they can possibly have there. And I would also add to uh, decrease the tax burden. So I just wanted to put that out there because I couldn't on the second. Um, but anyhow, I think, I mean, you know, I, it seems that from what I understand, there is still probably a, a, a consensus to move forward with pay display. Um, 
It's one of the things that we've talked about off and on for a number of years now. Uh, one of the things that I like about it, it's very quiet. Um, and um, it's, it's not, you know, bringing in huge groups that would disrupt neighborhoods. It's just, you know, a very quiet way to help us uh, get revenue in order to take care of this incredible asset. So I just wanted to add that. Um, what, are, what do other councilors think? Uh, Councilor Garvin, I know you just had your hand up. Yep, thanks. I just wanted to come back to the question of process that Valerie had. Um, I think w what I'd love to see and, and how I think it would make sense for this to progress is for the continued work um, on sort of the technical aspects that the Ordinance Committee would do combined with the ongoing research that Matt's doing around whether or not Cape residents need to pay, whether or not Maine residents need to pay, come back, combine sort of the technical work of the Ordinance Committee with the other um, sort of considerations around what, again, what, what should the ultimate fee schedule be, who would it apply to, all that kind of stuff, so that we then can collectively say, okay, with this being sort of all of the facts before us, is this what we want to move forward with? And if so, then, you know, go down the appropriate steps, like Matt said, of having a public hearing and things like that. So I'd rather just continue keep doing the work to sort of assemble the kit of parts so that once once it comes time, we have a, a chance to sort of vote on the whole thing, so. Is there any interest in voting to uh, authorize the town manager to proceed with pay, pay display? You know, we talked in the past about the, the options of uh, uh, lease, doing it for a year or two, any of that did, you know, I don't know, if, I didn't see anything about that in a workshop. I don't know if you discussed that or not. Because if, there, we've talked in, in the recent past about, you know, trying, uh, doing a pilot program for a year or two, you know, and, and again, you know, the longer we're not doing that, the longer we're losing revenue. I mean, I think this past weekend alone, I thought there were, and I saw in the paper, 10,000 people in the greater Portland area here from cruise ships. And, you know, all these folks are impacting us at Fort Williams Park. Uh, actually, Councilor Straw is next, and then Penny Jordan. Uh, and then I'll very quickly comment and then defer. Uh, with respect to the gentleman's uh, question about people parking in the surrounding neighborhood, one key aspect of the proposal is there a section of the park is going to remain free parking. Um, and it's structured so that people won't park outside the park because that's even farther than parking in the free parking area. So hopefully that will address that. Um, uh, with the uh, timeline um, for having everything in place, um, I, 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 with the trial, um, I assume we're not, we wouldn't even begin charging until the May to October period. So for me, it seems right. like we have a number of months to go here. So it isn't pressing that we must do this now. For me, okay. that said, I do support having a trial and then sending it out to a vote if at that point it seems like it's still contentious. Okay. And anyone else? Councilor Penny. I'm sorry, Penny. It's okay. <laughs> I think. <clears throat> Number one, I agree with two tracks. <clears throat> Number two, we've had a lot of conversation. We've heard a lot of input. We have a lot of data and criteria. I haven't seen a, a comprehensive document which, which states that things such as um, citizens not being charged for the fort, how that will be handled, the hows. Uh, so to me, to do a pilot until you take each one of the customer types and say, here's how it's going to be handled, um, we need to know what we're piloting before we do it. And I don't think we have a design yet. Mm -hmm. My thought was to, uh, plan, you know, could we plan, vote and plan to implement and then between the council, perhaps between now and next spring, make those decisions. Meanwhile, you know, it, things are in play for setting it up is what I was thinking. The, the things are in play already, I thought, um, because we are progressing, because I think what we're going through is a design process. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, at the end of a design process, you have a, a document, it can be two pages, it can be five pages, it can be seven pages, that says, here's how pay to display would work at Fort Williams. Here's how it would impact people who are visiting the fort who are non-citizens. Here's how it will affect 
affect people who are from Scarborough, South Portland, Portland, uh, here's how it will work. And I've seen all of the little bits and pieces here and there, but I haven't seen a comprehensive design document. Mm -hmm. And that's how my brain works. All right. Thank you, Council Lennon. I have a suggestion. Since this is on our agenda, I feel like we should vote on this. If people, if like we need to take an up or down vote, it's already been a motion whether to send this to ordinance. And then after we do that, I don't, I agree with Penny that I think it's, people are feeling uncomfortable about voting whether like, you know, we're gonna do this because we don't have enough information. But I do think we could just take people's temperature and say, hey, yes, we're okay with Matt taking the next step because I agree that we kind of need more of a concrete document before we can vote. So why don't we vote on the sending to ordinance, informally say, yeah, Matt, like, keep getting us some information and then we'll review it in a month. I, I feel like that's, that's the most, we can't really vote on something that's not on our agenda. So that's my suggestion for what we do right now tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor Garvin? I, I agree with voting on the motion that is actually on the table right now. <laughs> so I'd like to do that. <laughs> I, I don't think we need to do anything else because yeah. as yeah. Penny said, I think everything yeah. is ongoing. It's already going. It's, it's, it, the, the, I, there's nothing declarative that we need to do. Okay, so. that's fine. It's All like right. keep the momentum going yeah, keep back. Going. Well then I shall call, unless there are any more comments, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Uh, one, two, three, four, and opposed? One. All right, thank you. I think it was five. I'm sorry. You voted. Yes, four. I'm sorry, I voted in favor, so. Five. Yep. Yeah, five, five one. one. Thank you. Okay, next item, 137, sewer, sewer service area amendment, 33 Wells Road. Would anyone in the public like to speak to this item? Jerry, you got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Your name and address, please. Hi, my name is Russ Doucette, and I'm a general contractor in Scarborough, but do a lot of work in Cape Elizabeth. And I'm representing uh, the Sarkas and here to answer any questions that you may have, if you have any. Are there any About questions this? from counselors for Mr. Doucette? I have none. I have none. Looks like there aren't any. <laughs> no, we're just basically looking to hook up to the main sewer instead of having a septic system. Simple. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Russ. All right. Uh, Councillor Hello. Penny Jordan. I need to disclose that they're my neighbors. Okay. Um, and right next door, and uh, but I don't think that will impact my ability to be objective. All right. Thank you. Do counselors have any other concerns? Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> uh, this has. Uh, I'm going to ask the town manager to address this, but it has already been uh, approved by the planning board. I understand so. If you could speak to this item. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, as, as you may recall, this, this first arrived on the council's uh, docket back in August when uh, the request was made to amend the service uh, the service area map. And this is the one polygon that sits outside of the service area as it wraps around it. There is a stub in front of this. Uh, so the, the connection can be made easily and, and, and quickly. Uh, the only part that's slow in the process is the process that they're undertaking <laughs> right now, <laughs> quite frankly. So uh, it came to us and it came to the council in August. Uh, the council then sent it to the planning board to then review the request. And they've come back with a recommendation to amend the map. Uh, why this is on the council's agenda this evening is to send it to next month for a public hearing. Mm -hmm. And if, if the council would allow me, I'd be happy to also have an item for action following that on next month's agenda as well. So you could then have the public hearing and then make the amendment and then the Sarkis could go forward with uh, the rest of their construction project that Mr. Doucette uh, described. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, so is there a motion to set a public hearing for Wednesday, November 14, 2018 uh, to uh, recommend, to vote, to approve the uh, planning board's recommendation um, for the sewer service area amendment at 33 Wells Road. Is that Council Lennon? So moved. Is there a second? 
Second. Councilor Randall, any more discussion? Councilor Straw? I, I just want to uh, personally thank the planning board and the town planner for the updated format of the memorandum. I'm appreciative of it. Thank That's you. That's true. Yeah. Oh, and, and the town manager as well. <laughs> yeah, good enough, if, if I may. Yes, please. Uh, uh, yes, thanks. Thank you for that, Councilor Straw. That was an item of good discussion in the office uh, following uh, last month. So uh, you should see that going forward, I hope, as well. So thank you. Thank you. That's it. Very nice observation, Councilor Straw. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous, thank you. Thank you. Item number 137, eco main rates. Uh, is, would anyone from the public like to speak to this item? Seeing no one, I'll close the public comment opportunity and I'll ask our town manager, I, I happen to know Councilor Garvin, or Garvin is very interested in this item as well, but we'll let Matt start with that, I think. I'd be happy to, thank you, Madam Chairman. Yes, uh, I have a, the reason behind bringing this forward tonight to the council to uh, be informed of changes that will take place in the upcoming year. Eco Maine is looking to increase their uh, tipping rates. Uh, they have not increased, I think it's for, it's been five years since the last time those rates were increased, but now they're forecasting to increase them for next year by three and a half percent. So there will be a, a, an impact, and that's on the, the regular household waste, what you put in the compactor uh, up, at, up, up, at, up at the recycling center. Uh, so we'll be, we will be looking at an impact on our, on our budget for next year uh, when it comes to that side of the budget. Uh, the other part that's important to understand is, uh, and as it's no surprise to any that the recycling markets have collapsed uh, to historic levels. And as a result of that, EcoMain's revenues have taken an impact as well, uh, but they still handle the materials that come in. So the discussion that they had at the most recent uh, board meeting was to discuss what they're looking at for tipping rates for next year, but also what they wanted to do is look at doing something for this year as well. Uh, that met some pushback from the committee uh, basically saying, you know, it's, it's very difficult to make that adjustment mid-year uh, to, to an item that you did not anticipate having as an expense. So that's still a, a, a live point of discussion. If they do decide to go forward with that, they're looking at charging $15 per ton for the single sort recyclables that do come forward. Uh, and then starting next year on July 1st, then they would go to $35 a ton. That's effectively half of what it would cost if they just put it in the normal waste stream, uh, which is is reasonable, or at least trying to, you know, they're not gonna be handling it as waste, but they're also, they need to find a home for it. Uh, the only concern that I have, and I, what I would like direction from the council on is, as far as the mid-year uh, change at the $15 per ton, at this point, I, I, I had spoken with Kevin Roche, who's the executive director or CEO of EcoMain, and said, you know, it's very, very difficult for us to just throw a, you know, possibly up to a $25,000 item onto our budget that we didn't anticipate as an expense uh, for our, for our, for our waste handling. So, uh, but we'd be, you know, obviously, if we have a year or nine months in order to prepare for that in the next budget, then that would be something that we could at least plan for accordingly on the financial side of it. So I think other towns are also saying that, but I just would like to make sure the council would be okay with me continuing that direction. They may, the exec board may vote to still implement those fees, but uh, I wanted to A, let you know about the possible impact on the upcoming budget and B, let you know what we're looking at for potential impact on the current budget as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Councilor Penny Jordan. I, I have a question. I, I, I understand the rates and everything and why we need to do the increase. And I'm just throwing this out there that um, I'm sure Kevin and company at EcoMain are thinking about this. But the world of recycling is changing. And I'm sure there's a lot of conversation going on there. How do we start to address that? Um, and so I, I'd like, a, and I don't know what conversations are going on at EcoMain, but we know the landscape is changing. I mean, especially since China pulled out. Um, and so, and nobody else is stepping up to that degree. So um, I understand these fees, but I'm uh, hoping that in the next three to five years, there's some strategy that's taking place to start to address that shift that's occurring. So. I, I would say we, we are very well served 
by Kevin Roach. The band has done a great job because I, I go back to the years before Kevin came on board and where Ecomain was and the work that he's done. So he is he monitors this on a daily basis and I think he brings the board up to speed on, in an excellent level. But he does, I think he looks in five year increments at this point just with the way things have changed so dramatically in, in mm -hmm. the 12 month period. Uh, everybody's on their feet. I mean, they're right now it's a question of trying to find places to actually, you know, landfill materials or saving it and trying to find the spot market or trying to find places where we can pay somebody to take items off. I mean, I think it's sad that we're starting to talk about landfills again, but that's just another whole yeah. subject, not yeah, for tonight. Yes. But I think, Council Jordan, the long story short of that is I think uh, I think they're very much on top of it. And it's a it's a daily. <laughs> Uh, discussion there for sure with them. Okay. Councilor Carvin. Um, the first thing I'd say is that um, Kevin Roach would be more than happy to come to either one of our future meetings or workshops to uh, present to the council on um, anything regarding strategic planning for Ecomain. Um, he does that regularly uh, to other member communities. And I want to remind everybody that we are a member owner community of Ecomain. Um, both Matt and I um, hold seats on the board there as a function of being member owners. So one of the things that he and I definitely need is um, consensus and direction from the council on, because ultimately these these are things, you know, the, the increase in tipping fees for fiscal 20 have already been voted on. The um, uh, proposal for the uh, uh, implementation of tipping fees for recycling have not yet been voted on. So the, the board will be voting on that and so, as the representatives to that board, we're gonna need direction from the council generally. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that was not addressed is that um, there's a, a, a potential competing proposal for uh, addressing the point that Matt made around um, there not being ample opportunity for communities to you know, absorb a budget hit like that midstream. And so um, basically deferring that cost to fiscal 20, but at, at a catch-up cost too, so mm -hmm. um, there's you, you, you pay it now, pay it later kind of thing. But um, you're either signing on for it at, 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 the, at the recommendation now, or um, e either of those proposals are, are going to be considered by the board. Um, the other thing not addressed in here, but what I did talk about a little bit at the workshop last week, is that we are currently not, as a member-owner community, being charged any um, uh, fees for our contaminated recycling loads. Um, so that is something not specifically addressed in, in, in what you're seeing here, but is also something that we can anticipate certainly coming in the future. We are getting detailed reports, um, which we can make available to anybody who's interested, um, but Matt and myself and Bob Malley receive them on a weekly basis, indicating you know what is the contamination load, what is the source of the contamination, uh, where did that load come from? It's almost always right out here at the unmonitored silver bullets behind Town Hall. Um, not exclusively, but probably two thirds to 75% of it. Um, so that is also gonna have a financial impact to us at some point if we are, if we can assume that it's not possible to completely eliminate contamination. Um, one thing that Portland just announced that they're doing unfortunately is if you cross the bridge and, and go down uh, and loop around onto Commercial Street and, and go right, under, right across from Free Range Fish there. There's some parking lots and then the storage yard with about a half dozen to eight or 10 silver bullets for the community. They're, they're hauling those out. They're, pu they're pulling them because they're just seeing so much contamination in there that it's not worth it for them. So that's something that we're, you know, we're gonna have to think about and look at um, down the line as well. But so, you know, we, we, we've had the benefit for a number of years now, you know, tipping fees for mixed solid waste, MSW came down, um, you know, to the 70.5 rate that they are now in the last five year review on this. And we've had the benefit of, of things being pretty low and now, now things are catching up with us a bit. Hmm. Council Lennon. You know, the whole thing about contamination drives me crazy. Um, so, can I just suggest that number one, the people who monitor the one at the transfer station, they need to be like a, a zero tolerance policy. I mean, I've seen them stand there while someone puts a plastic bag in. No plastic bags, like zero. They have to just say, I'm sorry, but you have to empty that in here or go home and redo it. And then I think we should take something out in the Cape Courier, like a large ad in color on page three on the upper right saying, there are no plastic bags in our recycling. Like, 
with a bold border around it. And I think the signage out here is way too kind and small, and people are, I, I didn't even know there was a sign out there. I put my stuff there a lot. I think there has to be gigantic red, bold, sans serif letters across the entire silver bullet that says, you know, no plastic bags. Offenders will be, you know, charged or something. I mean, I think we have to get way more aggressive about that. And I'm not saying it's gonna solve the whole problem of all these fees, but we could start with having no contamination. We're in a small town, it's just public education. People aren't trying to be mean. But particularly if these things are going to landfill and that what would be potentially um, biodegradable is inside a plastic bag, that's just wrong. Uh, I, I just want to quit. So the only thing going to landfill right now is ash from the waste to energy facility. So oh. we're not landfilling okay. trash. Oh, we're okay. not landfilling recyclable materials. So, you know, Matt has, I've heard Matt say before, it used to be, you know, you'd say when in doubt, put it in the recycle because we've all been, you know, so conditioned to assume that almost everything is recyclable. Now things are tilting back a little bit. So if you're in doubt, put it in the trash because at the very least it's going to the waste energy facility which is creating relatively clean and efficient energy um, through that process. And the only thing that then goes to the eco main landfill is the ash byproduct from that. So there isn't anything that's actually going into capped or uncapped landfills. Mm -hmm. yep. And I will say from, from where I said, literally, I have a pretty good eye on the <laughs> silver bullets out back. And I was overjoyed to watch uh, someone last week empty half a dozen plastic bags into the recycling and then watch them take their plastic bags back. So the message is, is getting received by some, but we have to improve our, edu our, our educational approach on that or our sharing of the, the knowledge there. And our recycling committee is, is, is working hard on that as well. So I think you know, there are efforts in there, but it is, as Councilor Garvin said, the, the wish cycling Phenomena is, is killing us. You know, it's like the, you're getting killed by the best of intentions. Just, where just stream it on channel three. And <laughs> who's <laughs> dumping <Jim>. the trash? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, well, and monitoring with cameras. Yeah. And, <laughs> or hire well, someone for two hours uh, on a Saturday and Sunday, like the the, the the casino beach. I mean, that way decreased. Just. Yeah. The person was there on occasional weekend day, and all of a sudden, everyone in town knew that there was a guard there. I mean, you could literally pay someone to stand out there. Would probably be pretty effective. Well, I, the, when I was looking at the notes from the workshop on the second, when you were, you know, discussing some of this, um, I'm reminded that um, in in years past, well, in the last nine years, this conversation has come up particularly about the bullets behind town hall because they're not monitored. They were set up there as a convenience so that when we cut back on the transfer station hours in uh, I think it was 2010 maybe, when the recession hit as a savings, we then had uh, bullets here to help to help folks um, because we had cut back on you know Tuesdays and Thursdays at the transfer station. However, I you know our former manager used to complain uh, on a regular basis be about the fact that the the recycled bullets were so often filled with garbage. <laughs> and, and particularly um, during the weekends, people don't want to sit around with things like lobster shells and good, you know, that kind of stuff, and that, that would be filled with a bullet. So, uh, I, you know, I certainly can, can think it's possible that in the near future, maybe our bullets behind Town Hall aren't there anymore if we can't, you know, get better compliance or find a, a way to do that. I mean, it'd be a shame, but that conversation has been taking place ever since they were put there. So, just wanted to give you a little historic, historical perspective. Um, so anyhow, for uh, guidance then, um, just tell us what you would like to do. Are you asking us for, um, tell us specifically what you're asking. I think maybe uh, um, first would be, would you like us to basically push back on the, the charge for this year? or if, if it looks like we have a majority of positions going in the other direction as far as the fees are going to be established, do you want us to push for being billed later, you know, in, in the next fiscal year? Okay. It would be a little bit greater amount, but at least we may know what that amount effectively may be, a little bit sharper than where we are now, but it would be at a greater 
level than what we're at. Okay, so so whether the council is in agreement to, to start accepting these higher fees fairly soon in our current budget or delaying that and then paying extra for catch up. What are, what are your thoughts? Those of you who will be dealing with next year's budget. <laughs> it's got to be I mean, paying I think start paying, eventually. otherwise you're paying like interest. In a sense. You no, know, it's like, why pay more? I mean, unless it's like crushing. Nope. Any other thoughts? I mean, uh, my position would be just start paying because I'd rather do that and have some balloon payment due later that exactly. is just too difficult to deal with. I, yep. If I may, and Councilor Garvin can correct me if, I'm, if I misspeak here. The financial position of EcoMaine is extremely sound. Uh, so it's not a question of them, uh, of them being you know, overextended by any by any means. It's just a question of trying to find. Yeah, at the, at the present time, they have written some. You know, they have got some fairly capital intensive projects that are taking place there that has brought their cash levels down. But they're even with that being performed, they are extremely healthy. Uh, so it's not a question of short cash. It's just a question of trying to react to the market. Well, and if I may, for um, uh, Jamie. Uh, they have had some very healthy reserves, and I know there has been concern in the past that because we are member-owned, that some of those reserves should be returned to member communities, and, and so has there been any discussion on easing the burden of member communities with, you know, the, the uh, money that has been uh, uh, Accumulating set aside. That's that's been part of the uh, the reason why we haven't had tipping fees increased for and, and had them reduced for years uh, on one side for member communities. So we do reap the benefit from that from our membership side, and they've also brought down their cash reserves by investing it back into the facility. So they have been using some of their reserves that they have to to meet their capital needs that they have um, with with some much needed deferred maintenance on the building. Okay, Councilor Garvin. I would just kind of augment what Matt was saying, that the, the organization is in a strong financial position overall from a reserves and all that kind of perspective, but is forecasting for this year to operate at a loss um, based on the current markets. So, um, you know, part of what they're asking for is to offset that forecast. Okay. Um, the, um, you know, the question you raise around well, should we be getting anything back? I, I agree with what Matt said. Some of that is being reinvested into the service. Um, when we used to have an assessment that we no longer have, so when that assessment was sort of returned to communities, that was was one sort of relief of a burden. Um, the other thing is that as a, as a member community, we pay a different per ton tipping fee than those that are contract members too. So they, they you know, spread around that cost to the non-member owner communities as well. Any other thoughts? Well, I'll entertain a motion. Jamie, would you like to make a motion on this? Um, sure, I move that the council direct um, the manager and myself <laughs> as board members of EcoMaine um, to support the recommended $15 per ton for single sort recyclables beginning November 1, 2018. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Council Oops. Sure. Councilor Straw's hand went up before you spoke. <laughs> <laughs> you were both very quick, but I saw his hand first, so we'll give that to Councilor Straw. <laughs> Any more discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And our last item this evening is item number 133, our municipal election warrant. And this is for election day, Tuesday, November 6, 2018. And if the, our town clerk would be so kind as to just address this item briefly for us. Sure, I'd be happy to, thank you very much. Uh, in preparation for the, the election, the law requires us to formally notify voters of, um, of the election, uh, which as stated is Tuesday, November 6th. Uh, we'll be voting for three members of the council for a three-year term, three members of the school board for a three-year term, and the referendum question um, uh, to play, uh, does a voter plan favor a plan for the school department to join the Greater uh, Sebago Education Alliance Regional Service Center? 
Again, the election to be held on Tuesday, November 6th at the high school gymnasium. Polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, the warrant talks about absentee balloting process and the availability uh, of the registrar of voters to uh, register um, folks uh, to register to vote or corrections to the voter list. So it will be in order for the council to approve the warrant this evening. And if you do so, I would ask that you hold after the meeting to sign the warrant for just a moment. Great, thank you. So is there a motion ordered the Cape Elizabeth Town Council approves the municipal election warrant for Tuesday, November 6, 2018, as presented? So moved. Council Randall, so moved. Is there a second? Councilor Lennon, any discussion? All those in favor? It is unanimous. So uh, we've now, um, we're about to adjourn at this moment. We can invite any citizen to speak to us on any topic that was not on this evening's agenda. Would anyone like to do that? Seeing no one coming forward, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Councilor Lennon, second. Councilor Randall, all those in favor? It's unanimous and please uh, hang on for just a moment to sign the warrant.